right hand and left hand washing themselves, washing each other. If you take your two hands and you want them to wash each other, they need each other. And that the intimacy or the, the compatibility of ethics and wisdom was that they're really working together to do the same task. They weren't so separate. It wasn't like one was a low status and one was high status. But they had a certain quality, like two, two hands washing, washing themselves. And then there's a statement that um, about a wise person. The Buddha once talked about, you know, who is a wise person? And he actually talks about who is a, a wise person of great wisdom. So now we're back into the wisdom. And the Buddha said, a wise person of great wisdom is someone who cons- is concerned with the welfare of themselves. Aha, this is the selfish school. The welfare of others, the welfare of both self and others, and the welfare of the whole world. That's a wise person of great wisdom. And this concern with the welfare, maybe it's not to, doesn't some people want to associate direct, directly with ethics, depending how we define ethics, but it does show that um, if ethics has to do with how we relate to the world, <clears throat> how we care for the world, that um, this is what how wisdom is defined as someone who has this kind of caring attitude and concern for the world. And a person of great wisdom is someone you know is someone who is enlightened. And the idea that, so if someone asks, you know, I'm involved, someone says, you tell somebody you're involved with Buddhism, and they say, oh, Buddhism, that's the one that, that's the school, the religion has enlightenment. What is it like to be an enlightened person? Now you know what to say. And someone who's enlightened is concerned for the welfare of the whole world. Self, others, both self and others in the whole world. And so these are interesting statements that are made. And then uh, it gets more and more interesting the more I studied it. <clears throat> and at some point, it became uh, inseparable, the Buddha's teachings about ethics and the Buddha's teachings about wisdom. Inseparable, the path to liberation, the path to awakening, enlightenment, and the path to, ep- to ethical maturation. That the path, to, um, the path to enlightenment, which is clearly what Buddhism is about, is the same as a path to the maturation of our ethical, of being an ethical person. That the culmination of becoming an enlightened person is to become uh, completely through and through an ethical person. Uh, These two are, they're not separate. It's not like one is kindergarten Buddhism, but they really go together. And kind of the way you know whether someone's maturing in enlightenment is say that if they live in a more ethical way. Now it's possible to be ethical in uptight ways. It's possible to be ethical following just strict rules and regulations. But then, but if you're if you're doing Buddhist practice, then the Buddhist practice, all the different elements of the Buddhist practice, have an ethical quality to them, have a quality of developing a person's ethical life. And I'll I'll describe that a little bit. First, I want to say about the goal, the enlightenment goal. Why I say that the you know the enlightened person is also an ethical person is that um, uh, this er- this early Buddhist tradition uh, will say that um, make the claim that all unethical behavior, whether it's by physical action, by speech, or just how you think, how you think, all unethical behavior is comes out of three fundamental tendencies. They call them the roots. And those roots are considered to be unethical. And the language that they use is more strictly, more, more uh, the tradition is not ethics, but they use the word um, unwholesome or unskillful, unskillful. And so there's three unskillful roots uh, basis, foundations for all unethical behavior. Those are greed, hatred, and delusion. The definition, the most common definition in, the, in this early tradition for what enlightenment is, for what nirvana is, it's the destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion. The very basis for being unethical is destroyed with enlightenment. 
and if those if the roots for uh, unethical behavior is destroyed, then the person has become ethical. They're not going to do anything intentional, consciously intentional, to harm other people, to do something that's hurtful for others. Um, if these greed, hate, and delusion have, up, have been uprooted. So this is how with it, 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 they really come together with enlightenment. They're kind of inseparate, inseparable. And the Buddha was most, most uh, commonly kept referring to people who were enlightened or, or to enlightenment or to nirvana in what could be called ethical terms, the destruction of greed, hate, and delusion. He didn't talk about it from you know, cosmic consciousness or some great blissful state of mind. Um, he had lofty terms for it, like enlightenment and awakening and liberation and, and nirvana. But over and over again, we actually explained what he meant. He explained it by the destruction of greed, hate, and delusion. And there are other words a little bit like that, the destruction of something, the ending of something, the, the letting go of something, that uh, all these things, attachments that are the source for being unethical. So then it's, then what about the practices? So last week I talked about the Eightfold Path. And these are eight sets of practices which, uh, are, which are a way of organizing all the important practices in Buddhism that lead towards liberation. And if we analyze these eight, these eight sets of practices, it's pretty easy, I think, to see how each one of them is, has an ethical quality are ethical in nature. Um, the first one is called right view. And one of the ways the right view is understood, it's uh, having an insight, having a really clear understanding of the nature of suffering, its arising, its ceasing, its ending, and the way to its ending. Suffering is another way of talking about harm. If, if you understand about suffering really well, if you're intimately connected and know it well, that's one of the jobs of Buddhists. We, it shouldn't be in our public advertisement, no one would come. Uh, uh, come to Buddhism and become really intimate with suffering. You know, that doesn't sound like very much fun. But uh, this is kind of, to really have a really clear understanding of the illness is a way to the cure. And so to really understand not only suffering, but the origin, the beginning of it, how it arises, how it comes to be, but more importantly, that we're not stuck with it, that there's an end to it. It can, it can stop, it, we could cease, it could... And to have some sense of how it works makes a person acutely aware of suffering and the possibility of ending of it that lends itself to that person now becoming very sensitive to suffering in others as well. And with that kind of sense of sensitivity, people don't want to cause harm. They don't want to be involved in har causing harm. So this right view has built into it this idea that a view that kind of wants to kind of decrease harm uh, production in this world. The other thing that uh, right view is, it's understanding that our conduct and how we act has consequences. And that good, uh, good behavior, ethical behavior, has good consequences. And unethical behavior has bad consequences. And to be acutely sensitive to that uh, is one of the ways of becoming, wanting to be more ethical. Not because we follow rules that we should be ethical, is that we don't want to have those kinds of consequences for ourselves and others. The second of the Eightfold Path is right attitude, right intention. And uh, these are three sets of attitudes with which everything we do, we can, we can do it with these attitudes. And uh, two of them would seem explicitly ethical because two, one, two of them have to, are having the attitude of kindness, and the attitude of compassion, the attitude of non-ill uh, uh, non will and non-cruelty. And you have those qualities in yourself and your attitude go about, go about your life, then you're going to be looking at the world ethically. The next three are all ethical, explicitly so. Right speech, right action, and right way of life. So we don't, right speech, you don't lie. 
right action. You don't uh, kill, steal, or harm through your sexuality. Right livelihood. You don't have a li- you don't have a way of living in the world, or livelihood, that is causing harm. Harm, the presence, the cause, and then and the cause and the ending of harm, is the core definition of what ethics is in Buddhism. It's all about harm and the and ending of harm. It's not about some kind of uh, abstract ultimate rules coming down from the heavens that you have to act a certain way. It's this very practical concern about not causing harm and causing benefit. The uh, sixth of the Eightfold Path is called the right effort. And that is uh, the effort that if you notice you're doing something that is unwholesome, unhelpful, unskillful, unethical, uh, if you, not- you, you notice that you notice it for yourself that this is harmful, then uh, you would stop doing it. If it's skillful, wholesome, helpful, beneficial, then keep doing it. And this is a little principle that applies in many areas of life. It's, um, it's often considered to be really the essence of meditation practice. If we're going to become our own teachers in meditation, this is the guideline by which we look at our, our inner life as we meditate. Am what I'm thinking about right now is the attitude I have in my meditation, is the way in which I'm practicing right now, is it skillful, helpful, wholesome, beneficial or not? So, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, mostly thinking about you're sitting down to meditate and your whole time you're, you're um, trying to calculate the best lottery numbers. You know, and, and, but then you remember, oh, right effort. It means I'm supposed to look at what I'm doing and see, is this helpful or, you know, is this skillful to do this? Then you might discover, you know, it's not that helpful to spend meditation time thinking about lottery numbers. And then you might stop doing it. Or you might look and you're really trying hard to get concentrated so you can get, you know, some kind of wonderful bliss states. And you look at yourself as you're doing this and you say, wait a minute, this kind of striving, kind of a little bit, little bit uh, conceited effort to have the really good bliss states, this is actually unwholesome. It's unskillful to do that. And, to really, and you feel that inside. You feel the tension of it, the strain of it. This doesn't feel good. And because you feel the tension, we let go. Well, this, this kind of whole evaluation of whether it's skillful or unskillful lends itself to being ethical. And then we come to right mindfulness, the seventh of the Eightfold Path Factor. And this is where it gets even more interesting. Um, there's plenty of people here in the West, teachers, and who've taught mindfulness with very little reference to ethics. For the Buddha, he repeatedly talked about how the practice of mindfulness is an ethical practice. That practicing mindfulness makes a person ethical that uh, the practice of mindfulness, really paying careful attention, in and of itself uh, um, diminishes these three roots of greed, hate, and delusion. That the more mindful we get, the more difficult it is to act unethically. The more difficult it is to uh, uh, violate the five precepts. Precepts of not killing, not stealing, not engaging in sexual misconduct, not lying, and not uh, getting intoxicated. And so there's something about the careful sensitivity that comes with mindfulness. That now we're really talking about we are becoming our own teacher. There's nothing about rules anymore. Nothing about you're obligated to be ethical. It's all from the inside out through, through being more and more aware of the impact of what things happen to you on the inside. You realize, wait a minute. To kill someone feels really lousy. Even the motivation to do it is a kind of violence to me. To uh, steal, to engage consciously, intentionally with sexuality in ways that harms people, it just feels really bad. You can feel how we're knotted up, we're tight, we're alienated from ourselves, we're caught up in 
states of mind which are not productive and helpful for yourself or for someone else. And we start feeling the stickiness of it, the, the undissatisfactory quality of all these different states. And it's kind of like you take your hand off a hot stove, like you don't want to touch it. And so ethics at this point through mindfulness has that kind of almost physiological, biological kind of instinct as part of it. You get close to wanting to harm someone through your ethics and you pull your hand back. No, you don't want to do that because we're so sensitive. Generally, it's thought that more often than not, most of the time, that those people who are doing unethical things in the world, they're actually out of touch with themselves. They somehow have been disassociated from their feelings, their emotions, and the impact, and really paying attention to what's really going on here. They're living up in their head, they're living in their desires, they're kind of being projected forward into the goal and what they want, and the, the um, you know, uh, the lust for power sometimes. The Buddha tied to uh, the Buddha connected uh, unethical behavior with the desire for power. And um, so over and over again, Buddha talks about mindfulness cultivates ethical and ethical, peop- ethical people. And then the final step, the Eightfold Path, is right concentration. And right concentration is a beautiful practice of settling the mind so that it's unagitated, the mind is tranquil, the mind is clear, undistractable, so the mind then can not so much focus on something, the mind can, the attention can settle on something, like on the breathing, and just be there just easily and almost naturally because there no, there's no distractibility, there's no agitation. A mind that has no agitation, is tranquil and clear, is a mind that has very little or no greed, hate, and delusion. It has very little preoccupation with wanting to kill or steal or lie or sexual misconduct or, you know, thinking about where the local liquor store is. Those are all agitated states to be involved in. And and one of the wonderful functions of concentration practice is to give an individual a really clear experience, inner experience of a kind of ethical purity, a kind of clarity or feeling of being clean, cleanliness inside of the mind, of the heart, of the inner body. They just feel so great. It's kind of like great, like waking up from the most refreshing nap you've ever had. Ah, oh, wow, it's so good. I feel so clear and bright and rested and all that. So to, to discover this kind of ethical clarity inside is one of the wonderful consequences of getting concentrated. If you experience that, then you're probably not going to want to be unethical because then it's kind of a a violence, a violation of this wonderful, very healthy, wholesome, beneficial kind of experience, way of being in the world. And we learn that to be unethical, we're becoming more and more agitated. You have to be agitated to some degree to be unethical. And the more agitated we become, the more alienated we come from the core of who we are, core, core of in our life. So that's kind of a going through the Eightfold Path and saying how each of those steps has an ethical quality to them. An ethical quality means it has to do with how we live in relationship to other people and the world around us. And that, uh, and that uh, as we follow the Eightfold Path, it becomes a natural thing to want to live in the world, in the world of other people, and not cause harm. And even better, to be concerned with the welfare of others, to care about people, and want to to take care of them. And I find that one of the, uh, so as I I practiced and as I studied, I just really started seeing more and more the convergence of wisdom and ethics, the convergence of doing the mindfulness practice, and not only becoming ethical, but becoming more and more interested in ethics. I believe that the deeper someone practices, the more thoroughly mature someone comes, becomes in mindfulness practice or in Buddhist practice, the more um, natural 
is for them to be an ethical person, to think ethically, to be concerned ethically. And again, what I mean by that is to be concerned with harm and benefit, the welfare of the world around them, to care for people and not want, and to not want to cause harm. And that becomes an ori- ori- orienting principle of a Buddhist, Buddhist's life, is this idea of not causing harm, but doing the opposite, to be, so promoting the welfare and well-being of oneself and others. And, um, and so this practice, so the Buddha, back in the ancient times, um, I think he was brilliant uh, in, in seeing this connection between inner liberation and becoming ethical. And then he kind of did this wonderful Aikido, this wonderful, you know, uh, sleight of hand almost, where he kept, he, he had all these lofty ways of talking about enlightenment and practice, because that's what was expected back in his time about what, really, what you know, spiritual practices do. They offer lofty goals. And, um, and then he was constantly kind of slipping in that it's, it's an ethical goal. It's a practice of becoming more ethical. And, uh, and he seemed to have been one of the, maybe not the only person of his time, but to have ethicized the religious life of, the, of uh, an ancient, <coughs> Indi- in ancient India. Ethic, from the ancient literature that we have, ethics was not a big part of religion um, before him. But uh, with him, it became center stage. But you don't see that very often, I think, if you go read books, Introduction to Buddhism books. They'll make passing refuge, reference to ethics. They might even have a whole chapter saying ethics is really important. But it's only one chapter. And then they move on to talk about all the other lofty things, emptiness, you know, or whatever, dependence arising, and all these wonderful philosophical things. But the impression I have is that uh, the teachings of the Buddha were through and through ethical in nature. Now, to say that to some people, like I'm saying it here, could feel oppressive. Because some people have had oppressive experiences with people's promotion of ethics and telling us how we're supposed to live and, and you should be this way. And, and uh, some, some ethical teachings have been really detrimental to whole wide populations of people that uh, you know people are told basically you're you're bad you're evil because of your sexual orientation your gender all kinds of things and then there's often comes with very strong uh, sometimes uh, sense of obligation that you're obligated to be ethical you're obligated to be generous you're obligated to be this way so I've been studying these uh, teachings of Buddhism for a long time And I don't see anywhere in the teachings of the Buddha where he obligates anybody to be ethical. So there's no, so how do, so he's teaching people how to be ethical with no obligation as part of it. Isn't that a relief? I think it's great. You're not obligated, (laughs) but watch out (laughs) because you'll become ethical. (laughs) There's no obligation, but. You should know it's coming. It's coming in through the back door. You'll end up being a good person. <laughs> Just watch out. <laughs> but you don't have to. <laughs> but if you're serious, it'll happen. Anyway, so I think it's I think I think it's very important to emphasize the non-obligatory nature of all this, um, <clears throat> because of how some people really. Uh, has struggled under the sense of obligation and internalizing the sense that I have to be a certain way to be a good person. And um, so there's a whole different attitude in, in this early Buddhism with, around this ethics. <clears throat> I like to think of it that through the, if you start doing the practice of the Eightfold Path, <clears throat> then <clears throat> ethics uh, uh, gets a, awakened, awoken, uh, in a certain way, from the inside, and it grows and blossoms. And it's not an external rules that you follow. Um, so it's an important part of Buddhism. It's in, it's an inter, integral part of the whole path of Buddhism. It's not 
kindergarten Buddhism is not just something you do a little bit at the beginning of Buddhism, you know, the first year you practice and you put it aside and get onto the real things. Uh, it is the real thing, all the way to enlightenment. The path to ethical maturation in Buddhism is the same as the path to spiritual liberation. The path to spiritual li- liberation is the same as a path to ethical maturation. They're one and the same. And if you don't believe me, that's fine. There's no obligation. Find out, but then find, do the practice and find out for yourself. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if you practice sincerely and that you'll discover this is be a case for yourself as well. So we have about 10 minutes before the end. And uh, do you have any questions about this? Any comments, any testimonials, or any protests? (laughs) Thank you. Um, I'm curious how much you think the emphasis on ethical practice in Buddhism um, can get in the way of like more shadow integration work. Mm. So uh, an emphasis on a, a certain way of being um, causing a subconscious suppressing of different parts of you sure. uh, and not being able to welcome and integrate them. Yeah, I think it depends how we, how we incorporate ethics into our life. If we take it on as rules, or as social norms that we're supposed to take on, then it can become shadows, then it can be obscure the parts of us that are not that. And, um, and all, all groups have shadows. So our group here, you know, Western Buddhism circles where I've been in, kind of the normative ethics is to be a kind person. And, but if that's what this kind of, kind of what's approved of, then it's a little bit hard to come in here and be mean you know, or be angry or be grumpy. You know, I, I sometimes I'm grumpy and, and uh, I've come down here and I, I feel, you know, I, you know, I'm the teacher here. I shouldn't be grumpy, you know. And so maybe I don't show my grumpiness that, that easily. So then it goes in the shadow. And so, so that's the, the anger. Uh, and also people in, uh, in kind of, well, at least in the Western Buddhist circles, uh, uh, tend to be uh, conflict avoidant. And... Uh, so, you know, it's not, it's not so helpful. And, uh, but it kind of comes from this normative idea of what it means to be a good person or to fit into the group or all kinds of things like that. Um, and so, but all groups have this. All cultures have shadows. Um, but that's why we have a practice. And the function of practices like mindfulness practices or mindfulness practices is that um, uh, their job is to uh, put light in the shadow. So... Uh, we can't help having, you know, these cultural things because we have to find some way to get along. But then it's really important to go do this practice, and I think then then it all that stuff gets uh, looked at. It also means you don't have to be too afraid of the shadows. It'll they'll all come. It'll all come out if you're practicing mindfulness sooner or later. So I s- behind you, all the way in the back. Uh, one of the writings you mentioned today uh, said that an ethical person is concerned with the welfare of self, the welfare of others, the welfare of self and others, and the welfare of the whole world. I'm interested in what you think the distinction he was making was between all of those categories. It seems like the first two cover everything. Great. Right? But uh, what about what distinction was he making with self and others and the world? Great. That's a great question. And. Uh, the, the one that I find the most interesting is the third one. Um, the wise person is concerned for the welfare of both self and others. And how is that different from, as you said, the first two? Because that seems to cover it. And so these might be modern interpretations. I don't know what the ancient were, were thinking. But one idea is that the, uh, uh, both self and other is the we. It's the relationship between us. It's we as a community. So like a family or a couple or a group like this, um, that has a different dynamic and different kind of uh, patterns in which of 
networking, of relationships, of agreements, all kinds of things. That's uh, that's there because we're working together. And so it's no longer just the individual, but it's the community, it's the connections that are going. And so we're paying attention to that relationship, those connections, when we hate both self and other. Mm-hmm. It's the we, the you, I, and we, that they say, right? That's, that's one idea. And the whole world, um, the, uh, uh, this is again, I don't know what they were thinking back then, but uh, I like it because um, this thing about uh, welfare of self, welfare for others, welfare for self and others, um, I think, in my mind, but I think it's probably the meaning in the ancient world, it's primarily human-centric. But as soon as you say the whole world, you, you expand beyond being concerned for the humans, but the welfare of all the animals and creatures and the planet and you know the, the whole thing. Thank you. You have to push, push the button so there's a light on it. I think, I think it becomes green. Um, really appreciated the, the talk, and um, it was very timely for me. Um, I, I was wondering if you could comment on the sorrow uh, that you might experience when you witness someone who is suffering from greed, hate, or delusion, Uh Mm. and might be behaving in a way that's unethical. Mm. The sorrow. So, as I said, the the sixth step of the Eightfold Path is to learn how to make certain distinctions. Distinctions between what is helpful and not helpful. And so, you think that there's a distinction between sorrow that's helpful and sorrow that's not? What would that what would that look like? What would that be? Uh, in my mind, it might uh, unhelpful sorrow might be uh, something akin to despair, and um, a helpful sort of sorrow would be a kind of mourning. Mm-hmm. Great. And what, what what and what do you think despair would uh, was that the word you use despair? Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, uh, what are the conditions uh, that have to be there that, are per, that are in a person so that they would experience something and feel despair? Definitely agitation. Agitation, so they're agitated? Yeah, mm-hmm. and... Uh, mm, self-concern. Self-concern, so self-preoccupation. Rather than being concerned with that person being uh, having a hard time... I'm, it's, I'm, I'm concerned with my discomfort around it, or my responsibility for it, and so that, and then a healthy kind of sorrow would be a feeling of pain, a feeling of of, um, of you know just genuine concern for the other person, without referring it back to oneself. Thank you. Yeah, I would. I think that uh, if we can learn to distinguish between good grief, because that's what Charlie Brown had, <laughs> good grief, and if we use that language, bad, you know, the Charlie Brown language, bad grief, uh, you know, it'd make a whole different world. We don't. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We don't want to kind of reject all these things: sadness, sorrow, grief. But we want to be able to distinguish between a healthy and unhealthy version of it. And that's part of the functions of mindfulness to help us with that. So, anything else? All your ethical issues have been settled once and for all? (laughs) Yes? Yeah, the mic, please. No, you have to make sure the, the light's on. Okay, I don't know how well thought out this question is, but I have been noticing about myself, having grown up in Brooklyn, that my personality is holding on to an edge, you know. (laughs) And I think the edge 
sometimes is a protection of the fear that if I let go of that part of my personality that I will be more responsible for everything. <laughs> I don't know how I, how that connection is that, mm. that um, you know, that uh, there's obviously suffering involved, but that the suffering protects me from uh, stepping off the cliff, you know. So I just wanted to thank you for your talk, uh -huh. first of all, because it brought a lot of clarity to my understanding of of how the two hands go together. And um, it made so much sense for me. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I really much, I very much appreciate your self understanding about this. To be able to so, to be able to be so articulate about this tendency, for you is, uh, you know, you've probably took you a long time to come to that kind of clarity, and I, I appreciate that you understand yourself that way. And um, since you're here at a place where we do mindfulness meditation, then I could say that mindfulness, if you really give yourself to the meditation, um, that uh, you might discover. That if you, that you in the meditation you can begin letting go of the edge, and it, begin to explore the more deeply more of these issues. What's really going on down there underneath there, and go through the layers, and uh, it's really worthwhile to go through the layers. It's possible to eventually to put it all down, and you'll be safe. So great, thank you everyone. So I hope that my little attempt at a fireside chat was <laughs> was uh, nice for you all and and um thank you. <laughs>